Hi there! If this is new for you or just a review, welcome to the Fundamentals of Logic. This is part three. In the first two parts, we built a set of symbols that we can use to make logical arguments, and we got a process that makes them work. In this part, we will start to see how all these parts move together from the beginning through to the end of an argument. We're going to start by decoding longer logical expressions, so let's just review our rules from part two. There is a dominance order for the connectives. Here it is. We use brackets to change this order. Anything inside the brackets is less dominant than anything outside the brackets, similar to how we use brackets in arithmetic. To find the final truth value of a long compound statement, we start with the least dominant connectives and work our way up to finish at the most dominant connective, which is called the main connective. This gives us the output of the whole expression. We should try to make our logical expressions unambiguous, but if you do find two connectives that have the same dominance, then the convention is to work from left to right. Let's look at a couple of examples with more complex expressions. Look at these two expressions here. They only use p and q, but they are obviously more complex than our very simple truth tables from last time. You may realize that the conditional in the middle will be the main connective because it is the most dominant. So we do the other parts first as if they had brackets like this. We don't need these brackets, but they do help us to see the less dominant parts of the statement. These statements are still quite easy to explain in words. The first statement says that if both P and Q are true, then it's also true that at least one of them is true. The second statement says that if only one of P and Q is true, then both P and Q will be true. What do you think of those two statements? What do you think we will find when we look at the truth tables? In both cases, we'll start by looking at the disjunctions and conjunctions. We've put them in brackets, but this will be the same without the brackets because they are the least dominant parts of the expression. By using the truth tables, we can get one truth value for each side of the expression. These are the purple letters. We can then use the truth table for the conditional on these purple letters to find the output of the main connective. What do we find? We find in the top expression, every row is true, which seems to make sense. If both are true, then it is always correct to say at least one is true as well. This could not be any other way. Now look at the bottom expression. It's false on rows two and three. Again, we can still understand this in everyday terms, but this second table does have rows that are true, the first row and the fourth row. But we can understand intuitively that this expression is not good logic. If we know that one is false, how can both be true? We're leading to the idea of validity, which we'll come back to in a moment. But first, we need to ask what is special about the top table? There's a special name for a statement which is true in all situations. This is a tautology. And if a statement is false in all situations, we call it an inconsistency. A tautology is true no matter what the input truth values. It could never be untrue. Remember, we're only completely confident about the conditional when we see true inputs lead to a false output, and we know that this is bad. So if we can say that something is never false at all, then we can avoid this possibility. So when we're looking for the most reliable logical arguments, it doesn't matter if there are just some true rows on your truth table. It doesn't even matter if the line for the real world comes out to be true. It matters most if it could not be untrue. In other words, if there are no falses at all in your final output from the truth table. To quickly review that, a tautology is true on every row of the truth table, no matter what the inputs are. If a tautology is always true, then we must think obviously it's a good thing to base other logical arguments on, right? Probably. Remember, logic is a mechanical process, and a machine that makes ice cream is no good for baking potatoes. 
Make sure you have the right logical machine is what I'm saying. We should say that as long as our logical argument really fits the real world in the way we think it does, then yes, a tautology is always a good statement to base your arguments on. But we do need to be careful. And the inconsistency is the opposite case, as we said. No matter what the input simple statements are, the output will always be false. This is an inconsistency, and there's no way that it can be true. If we agree that truth is a good thing in our arguments, then inconsistencies are something that we should always avoid. So it's good to know what they are. Now that we've looked at tautologies and inconsistencies, we can see the third possibility, an expression that has both true and false outcomes on its truth table, depending on the truth values of the input statements. These expressions are called contingent. If we're going to get technical, then which line of the table we end up on always depends on the inputs. But for a tautology or an inconsistency, this doesn't affect the outcome, which will be true or false. In a contingent expression, this is not the case. So this is why careful logic gets really, really hard. There are a lot of different things to think about. You have to think about whether your individual simple statements are the right ones, and then if they are true or false. You have to think about if your connectives are the right ones, and have you written them all clearly? Have you based your argument on a tautology, which would probably be a good thing, or an inconsistency, which would certainly be bad? As humans, we can't always look at every decision in this way, but it's important to remember that you, yes you, make everyday judgments by using your beliefs as premises in an argument and coming to a conclusion without even thinking about it. This is why snap judgments are dangerous in the real world and in complex situations, and this leads to the important topic of bias, which is real, political, and quite controversial, so we will just quietly scamper back to maths and logic for today. Things get even more complex if we add just one more simple statement. Remember, a compound statement made from x simple statements has 2 to the power of x possible situations, because we multiply by 2 x times. So we're doing even more lines, and if it hasn't happened already, you probably now can't keep track of all the options in your head. Don't worry, this is normal, and it's just why we need to have a set of rules that can work through our logic for us. If you do get deeply into logic, then you will start to get more intuition about these complex cases. But let's look at an example. What about this statement? If it's not true that it's Monday or Thursday, then I will go swimming after work. Which is a pretty weird way of saying I go swimming after work every day except Monday and Thursday. But the first version will make it easier to put into symbols. How would we do this? Pause if you want to think about it, but this is how we would show that statement in symbols. Now let's look at the truth table. If you would like to try this truth table for yourself first, then pause the video here. Plug in the values of M, T, and S, and then work from the least to the most dominant connective. We decode the answers in exactly the same way as we saw last time. So in this example, we start with the bracket, which is a disjunction, the purple column. This is the least dominant connective. Then outside the bracket, the negation applies to it, so next we will just negate all the truth values of the bracket. This is our red column. Finally, we have the conditional to find the truth value of the whole statement. Because of the way that the conditional table works, almost all the outputs come back as true, meaning we don't know it's false. This statement is only false on the very last line, so it is not a tautology. We'll leave decoding expressions there for now. That is only a few examples, so you should practice further. If you would like me to look at some more examples, then please comment below. The rules are always applied in the same way. Start at the least dominant connective and work up to the main connective. But it can be difficult to follow at first. Don't give up. Now let's move on to arguments. In everyday language, an argument is when two or more people disagree strongly and often loudly about something. 
These arguments happen because people end up with different ideas about what is true or false. So an everyday argument comes from a disagreement in people's logical arguments. In everyday situations, people aren't usually thinking about the logic behind what they're saying. Maybe it would be better if we did this more often, but logic is not so different. Logicians can disagree loudly about things too. But logic does try to be more organized so you know exactly what you are arguing. And we do this by having the structure to our argument, which we already mentioned in the earlier parts. Let's look at another simple argument. Remember, we said when we make an argument, the statements we use as evidence are our premises, and these support the conclusion of the argument, which is what we want to claim. We suggest that the conclusion is true because the premises are true. The premises entail the conclusion, or one more way, the premises are a sufficient condition for the conclusion. Here is a very simple example. Premise 1 claims that if Steve is a dog, then Steve is an animal. Premise 2 claims that Steve is a dog, and from this we would conclude that Steve is an animal. How would you write this argument in symbolic form? Pause if you want to think about that. In fact, this is how we would write this argument. The first premise is a conditional, if P then Q. The second premise is a simple statement, the antecedent P. We separate them with a comma, and then we use the double turn style for therefore, before our conclusion, which is another simple statement, Q. As I've said before, there is more than one system of logical symbols. You might have used our symbols, but laid them out in a column like the argument itself. So there are different ways you might have done this. One other thing you might have done is used something instead of the double turn style. After all, we haven't used this symbol yet in our course. But what could you have used instead? As I said, we introduced the double turn style, we said it meant therefore and is used for the conclusion to an argument, but then we didn't really use it. You might wonder if we actually need it. Couldn't we just use the conditional? If all of our premises are true, then the conclusion is true. The answer to that is yes, kind of. We even call this the corresponding conditional of our argument. Take all of your premises and put them in conjunction as the antecedent, and then your conclusion as the consequent of a conditional, and this is similar to our argument. So there is a connection, but we're going to use the double turn style and later on the single turn style to introduce conclusions, partly just to separate the conclusion from the premises, but there's some reasoning too. If we're doing good logic, we want good arguments, and for our system, logicians have decided that arguments need to preserve truth. In other words, we should never go from true premises to a false conclusion. Notice I just said decided. We said in part one that other systems of logic are possible, but this one has proven useful and it seems to fit with the languages we use. So this is the system we are learning. If an argument is written so it can never give a false conclusion from true premises, we call that a valid argument. A valid argument is what we think of as a good argument in this way because it preserves truth. How can we use our truth tables to see validity? We are actually going to use the corresponding conditional that we just spoke about above. We are going to put all the premises in conjunction with each other, that is the antecedent of the conditional, and then the conclusion is the consequent. An argument is valid if the corresponding conditional is a tautology. Remember that in the conditional truth table, the only line we can be absolutely clear about is that if a true antecedent leads to a false consequent, then that conditional is false. This is how truth is not preserved, so if this is the case we must avoid. Let's look at our example from above. If P, then Q. P, therefore Q. We start with premise 1, which is the least dominant. It's a conditional, but it's inside brackets, so the output for premise 1 will just be the conditional truth table. This is in conjunction with premise 2, which is just the same as P. 
So the outcome of the left-hand side is the outcome of this conjunction. The outcome of the whole expression is the conditional with Q, and we can see that it is a tautology. Every row is true. We never go from true premises to a false conclusion. Notice, though, that all three other possible outcomes are found in this table. But the validity of this argument is fairly intuitive. If P then Q, P is true, and so Q is true. This argument is so famous, in fact, it has its own name. It's called modus ponens, which is Latin for way of affirming. How about this next example? If I study hard, then I will pass maths. I did not pass maths, therefore I did not study hard. Is this a valid argument? What is your sense? Pause if you want to think about it, and if you want to work through the columns of the truth table yourself. We start again with a conditional for premise 1, and then make that a conjunction with premise 2, which is a negation. This gives the outcome of the left-hand side. Put this in conditional with the conclusion not P, and that gives us our outcome. And again, we have a tautology. This is called modus tollens, or way of denying, and it is a valid argument. But look at the example again. We can imagine a situation where I do study hard and I still do not pass maths. So what is going on? This would be an example like we mentioned above, where we need to attack the conditional premise 1. It does not capture all the possibilities. There is one or more suppressed premises to the conclusion, then I will pass maths. How about this one? If you are healthy, then you are wealthy. You are wealthy, therefore you are healthy. Although it might seem very similar to modus ponens, it is not the same. Premise 2 is Q instead of P, and this is why the argument fails. Even though this table is true on three lines, we can see for ourselves that it is not always going to be true. If we follow the logic through in the same way, we find the third line is false. This is called the fallacy of affirming the consequent. Notice, when P and Q are true, the outcome is true. This might make us think it is a good argument, but this argument could be false, so it's not valid. Let's see what this means. Why can't we say an argument is valid if it just gives us a true output from true inputs? Remember, when we talk about validity, we talk about the form of an argument, not its content. There must be no possible way for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. And this has to be true for all possible arguments that take this form. For example, look at these three arguments. All of them are examples of the fallacy of affirming the consequent. The first one is the example from the last slide. It is fairly clear that the two premises do not entail the conclusion. You could say that if you are wealthy, you have a social and economic advantage in being healthy, but that is a different and more complex argument. We could also attack the conditional in this first case, but the second argument modifies it so that the conditional is definitely true. In fact, it is a tautology. But the argument as written is still invalid for exactly the same reason as the first. The conditional is if P then Q, so we must have P so we can say we have Q, not the other way round. The third example is the same, but it shows an example of row 3 on the truth table. This is the case where the argument comes out as false, because if P then Q is actually true on this line. We really want our arguments to be good and true. We have seen that even a valid argument can lead us to error if the premises are not true. So this is what we will call a sound argument, a valid argument with true premises. Sound arguments are our best version of a good argument. But sometimes getting people to recognize a sound argument is not just as easy as showing them the premises. A sound argument that is clear and understandable to the audience is sometimes called a cogent argument, but we'll see that cogent has a special meaning in a few moments. 
Here's another example first though, is this argument valid or invalid? If the moon is made of cheese, then 2 equals 1. The moon is made of cheese, therefore 2 equals 1. You might recognize it already, this argument uses modus ponens, and if we work through the tooth table, we can see that it is valid. But clearly, this is not a sound argument. We can attack both premises. Premise 1 makes the highly strange claim between the state of the moon and the number line, and premise 2 makes a claim about the moon which is known to be untrue. There are people who ask, how do you know that this is untrue if you've never been to the moon and checked for yourself? This is the kind of thinking that leads us to conspiracy theories. Bluntly, for the non-believer, a conspiracy theory is something that people believe that they shouldn't believe. For the believer, it's just a theory and they think they should believe it. And there is the problem. Should and shouldn't comes down to values. Sometimes, our premises cannot be 100% confirmed, and this lets tiny uncertainties creep into our logical machinery. Here we meet a whole new difference in logical arguments, and we see the formal meaning of a cogent argument. Our logical machine preserves truth values. As long as we make valid moves with complete information, we can be confident in our conclusions. This is called deduction or deductive logic. But there is another kind of argument which uses premises that are not clear or cannot be confirmed. This is called induction. A cogent argument is one where we think the conclusion is most likely true based on the premises. What does most likely mean? It means that the premises cannot completely entail the conclusion, but there is some reason to believe the logical thread of the argument. This is inductive logic, and it's the first step towards something like fuzzy logic. We use the same logical machine, but the conclusions we come to have some uncertainty in them. This uncertainty means that inductive arguments will always be open to some skepticism. Skepticism is doubting a logical expression, or looking for a reason to doubt it. In reality, if you are creative enough, you can always find a way to doubt something by suggesting possible new premises or reasons not to accept the premises of an argument. In this way, almost every statement is inductive. But attacking 1 plus 1 equals 2 by asking what we really mean by 1 is not very useful in everyday discussions. And this is why we confidently say that the moon is not made of cheese. Even though we've never been to the moon, we have enough background knowledge to see that the moon is most likely a huge sphere of rock orbiting the Earth at a great distance. The key question in all this is how skeptical should we be in this issue at this time? The word should is highlighted again because this is where values enter into our premises. The more we rely on what we think should be true, the more uncertainty there will be in the answers we get from our logical machine. There is one more idea I want to bring up, and that is logical equivalence. This starts to lead towards part four, where we talk about how to make logical arguments without language. It's possible for us to say that two statements are logically the same. In part two, we talked about the biconditional and the two-way relationship it makes between statements. If this biconditional gives a tautology, then we can say that the two statements are logically equivalent. They say the same thing. Another way to say it is they can be derived from each other. The symbol which shows logical equivalence is a triple bar, like an equals sign with an extra line, which means is identical to. One example of logical equivalence is the exclusive OR. We talked about this in the last part. It is a useful way to show some of the detail in logic early on, but the truth is we don't need the exclusive OR as a separate function, because the exclusive OR is logically equivalent to saying or, but not and. 
It might seem like a lot of work to write it out in the second form, but it might be worth it if we can cut one connective out of our logical language. But it's still fairly clear how P or Q, but not P and Q, precisely captures the meaning of the exclusive OR. And if you want to check, then do truth tables for both of these functions. Another way to see logical equivalence is using De Morgan's laws. De Morgan's laws for two things say that the negation of their disjunction is equal to the conjunction of the negations, and also that the negation of a conjunction is the same as the disjunction of the negations. Yes, this is hard to pass if you just listen to it, but look at it symbolically, see the form, and you can understand what it is saying. The first law says that if P or Q is false, that must mean that both P and Q are false individually. The second law says that if P and Q is false, then at least one of those two simple statements is also false. De Morgan's laws can also be seen using sets and set notations. Sets are a different part of maths about groups of objects and whether things are a member of that group or not. These can be shown on Venn diagrams, with two sets like those on the right here. And the result of the laws is the area shaded in blue. The complement of a union is the same as the intersection of two complements. And the complement of an intersection is the same as the union of two complements. Don't worry if you don't know about sets. We have an old video, but you might recognize De Morgan's laws in the form of the sentence. We've just changed some of the vocabulary. Seeing these laws in very different ways shows that at the very root of the tree, all of mathematics starts to come together, and examples of extremely different forms can be based on the same mathematical principle. If we understand everything at this level and build up by valid moves from here, then we can hopefully be confident of our much more complex logic. This is what we start to look at in part four. So that is a working form of logical machine, and you can do quite a lot with just the parts we've looked at already. I want to say, as usual, these videos are a quick introduction. I hope it is clear, but you will need to practice with other examples and exercises to really understand what is going on. There is still more to look at, though, and in the next part, we'll move away from language altogether. Hi, hope you found that interesting. Like, comment, subscribe, etc. If you prefer shorter videos, you can find this cut up on our other channel just up there. But whatever you do, please keep learning something because no matter who you are or how old you are, every day really is a school day. Bye for now.